Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ. My name is Anna Zawoslanski, and I will be the moderator for today's session called Practical Solutions for Supporting Quality Improvement in Primary Care Through Health Information Technology. Before we begin, a few quick housekeeping items. Um, all of your phones, audio lines are muted so to reduce uh, noise interference. If you're having any um, technical issues, please send a message to um, ARC Evidence Now. That's going to be in the drop-down list in the chat window of your webinar console. It's a little blue uh, thought bubble um, that you'll see on top. Make sure to select ARC Evidence Now um, in, in the chat window when sending your message. And then throughout the webinar, if you have any questions you would like to submit, which we will answer at the end of the session, please um, send them uh, via, again, via the chat function to all panelists, which you'll see that in the drop-down menu. And with that, I'll turn things over to Bob McNellis at AHRQ. Great. Thanks, Anna. And uh, likewise, my thanks to all of you for joining today. We have over 200 people on the line already and, and expecting more, so I appreciate you taking time out of your day. As Anna said, I'm Bob McNellis. I'm Senior Advisor for Primary Care at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and I'm also a Project Officer for several of the implementation grantees in the initiative. I am thrilled to be with you for our first Evidence Now public webinar. And we're excited for a lot of reasons, but mostly because it brings together two bodies of work here at AHRQ, research on the patient-centered medical home and implementation of evidence into practice. We have a pretty straightforward objective for today's webinar, and that's to present ways that health IT can support quality improvement in primary care practices and pair that with some early learnings from an Evidence Now cooperative on applying health IT for quality improvement in the ABCs of heart health. Next slide, please, Gabrielle. So as you can see, we have an action-packed agenda for you today. I'll start off with introducing our guest speakers, and then I'll provide a quick overview of the Evidence Now initiative. After that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tricia Higgins. Tricia is a senior researcher at Mathematica Policy Research. Her work focuses on how healthcare policies and programs shape innovation and transformation in healthcare systems. Dr. Higgins was the lead author of an ARC white paper that you'll hear about today entitled, Using Health Information Technology to Support Quality Improvement in primary care. She'll summarize aspects of the paper, including factors supporting the use of health IT for quality improvement. She'll touch on case studies of primary care organizations making exemplary use of health IT for quality improvement and highlight recommendations for practices, IT developers, and decision makers. Following Tricia, Dr. David Dorr will take the stage. David is the Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Medical Informatics, as well as General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at Oregon Health and Science University. He's also the Principal Investigator of Care Management Plus. Its mission is to better understand how data, information, and knowledge can assist in transforming health for vulnerable populations. David will talk about how HIT can help, and hopefully not hinder, primary care by sharing lessons from the Healthy Hearts Northwest Cooperative. So thank you both for joining us today, and if we plan this right, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Next slide, please, Gabriella. So let's go down with a quick overview of the Evidence uh, Now initiative. You can go to the next slide. We often describe Evidence Now as coming from three streams of influence. The first was Million Hearts. It's an initiative launched by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2011 that aims to prevent one million heart attacks and strokes by 2017. Million Hearts focuses on two goals. First, empowering Americans to make healthy choices. And second, improving care by targeting the ABCS of heart health. That is aspirin for people at risk, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. Next slide, please. The second stream of influence came from the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or the ACA as we call it. Congress established the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund to disseminate patient-centered outcomes research findings. Many of you have, I'm sure, heard of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which gets a large portion of those funds, as does the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and ARC gets funds to support dissemination and implementation of PCOR evidence into practice. Next slide, please, Gabrielle. 
The third stream of influence is ARC's focus on primary care, and that is guided by the mantra you see on this slide, and I'll read it because it's important to us, and that is that ARC recognizes that revitalizing the nation's primary care system is foundational to achieving high quality, accessible, and efficient health care for all Americans. Next slide. These waters really run deep for us. I won't spend any time describing them all, but you see this long list of things that we've worked on related to primary care. Notable near the bottom of this list is ARC's interest in understanding how to use HIT for quality improvement. Next slide, please. That brings us to evidence now, whose goal is to ensure that primary care practices have the latest evidence on cardiovascular health and that they use it to help their patients live better lives. We do that through, achieve that goal through doing two things. First, to implement those PCOR findings into primary care practice to improve heart health. The second is to build primary care practices capacity to find and understand and use those PCOR findings in the future. And as a research agency, we are very interested in knowing whether externally provided quality improvement support, like that being provided through this initiative, speeds the dissemination and implementation of PCOR evidence. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through the next few slides very quickly, just so you have a sense of the scope of this project. We've invested over these three, almost four years, $112 million on seven cooperatives um, through grant mechanisms, one independent external evaluator. We have a technical assistance center both to help the grantees as well as ARC in communication and other um, technical assistance matters. We're hoping to reach over 1,500 small and medium-sized practices that work where over 5,000 primary care professionals work and serve over 8 million, 8 million patients. We anticipate that evidence now is our single largest investment in research since the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Next slide, please. Where are we? Well, we're all across the nation. We're coast to coast. We have cooperatives in New York City and in the great Northwest. We have them in the states of Virginia, North Carolina, and Oklahoma, as well as a two-state collaborative in the Southwest with Colorado and New Mexico, and in this tri-state area surrounding Chicagoland. The evaluation team, while situated in Oregon, but team members are across the nation. And the TAC is headquartered outside DC in Annapolis. Next slide, please. What are these cooperatives doing? Well, all are delivering multi-component interventions to primary care practices, typically utilizing these five services, data feedback and benchmarking, electronic health record support, shared learning collaboratives, expert consultation, and importantly, on-site practice facilitation and coaching. Next slide, please. How are we going to figure out whether we're successful with these interventions? Well, we're taking a three-fold approach, and that includes measuring the delivery of ABCSs in practice, both at the start of the project as well as at the end. We'll also be measuring practices' capacity for change and their ability to incorporate new evidence into practice. And finally, an, an exciting component of this um, uh, evaluation is a mixed method evaluation of the intervention itself, which includes both internal and external contextual factors. Next slide, please. To say the timeline is ambitious is an understatement. Um, the program launched in May of 2015. The cooperative spent the better part of the first year recruiting practices. We're now well into the intervention and data collection phases of things. You can see we've built time at the end for some post-intervention assessment to see if what they've done sticks, and then we'll spend some time getting all of that information out. But this webinar, part of the importance of this is we weren't going to wait to get lessons out until the end of the project. We wanted to start to get information out as, as soon as we could. Next slide, please. Well, where are we today? Um, I'm happy to announce uh, we have, uh, we, the cooperatives, have recruited over 1,500 primary care practices. We've met our goal, and that number is continuing to increase. All the cooperatives are now in the field with their interventions, and, and we're starting to see some of the early challenges. Um, uh, we're really learning a tremendous amount, not so much about the ABC delivery part yet, or even about practice capacity, although we're getting some clues about that, but really about the environment in which this project is operating. We're learning 
learning about the changing um, landscape of primary care. The sands are shifting beneath our feet. It's almost volcanic in nature, destroying and rebuilding uh, both at the same time. We've also learned about the challenges of the uh, new cholesterol management uh, based on the 2013 guidelines that had come out and how that's changed both the standard of care and our ability to measure it. And then finally, um, we are learning a lot about the ability of EHRs uh, to support research and quality improvement. And for those of you who've been um, uh, working uh, with or in primary care practices, I'm sure that comes as no surprise to you. And really, this is the point where we pivot today to lead to today's um, uh, uh, talk. Uh, and, and with that, um, next slide, please, Gabriella. What I'll do is I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Tricia um, uh, to, to walk us through the paper and, and your observations as we go through. So thanks again for being here. And Tricia, let me hand it off to you. Great. Thanks very much, Bob. I'm happy to be here today to share findings from the white paper that our team at Mathematica Policy Research wrote in collaboration with Bob and his colleagues at ARC. Um, next slide, please. First, I'll provide some background on why we wrote this paper in the first place. So the paper is called Using Health Information Technology to Support Quality Improvement in Primary Care. And it shares lessons learned from discussions with experts in fields such as health IT, clinical practice, primary care transformation, and human factors engineering, as well as with uh, representatives of primary care organizations that have made really great use of health IT for quality improvement. And the reason we wrote this white paper is that we know that health IT can be an important and effective tool for primary care practices to use in their ongoing quality improvement efforts. And we also know that in the past several years, healthcare policies and incentives have supported the adoption and effective use of health IT um, for quality improvement in primary care. And these have included the High Tech Act, which provided incentives for the meaningful use of EHRs the ACA, which emphasized the role of quality improvement and measurement in its strategic plan for health IT, and proposed health IT as a tool to improve patient safety, reduce medical errors, and ensure patient-centered care delivery. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT's creation of regional extension centers and ARC's own investments in this area. But even with these incentives, we know that barriers, including significant costs to primary care practices in terms of capital, clinician, and staff training, and time, have limited the use of health IT to support quality improvement. Now, despite these barriers, some primary care practices and organizations have found ways to effectively use health IT to support quality improvement efforts. And these practices can offer lessons to help other practices and ultimately to improve patient and population health outcomes. So the white paper describes factors in primary care practices that promote the use of health IT for quality improvement. And it identifies specific health IT tools that support this work. And I'll discuss both of those things today. The paper also presents case studies of exemplary primary care organizations and provides um, uh, some cross-cutting lessons and recommendations. And I'll touch on those today. If you're curious to learn more about the case studies, um, we hope that you'll read the white paper. And we may also have some time at the end to provide some insights that we gathered from those exemplary organizations. Next slide, please. Our methods included a targeted review of published literature. Um, we also convened a panel of eight nationally recognized experts in health IT, clinical practice, quality improvement, primary care transformation, health policy, and human factors engineering. And we also held in-depth discussions with representatives of three primary care organizations that have made really good use of health IT for quality improvement. And those included a small independent primary care practice, which was Foresight Family Physicians in Grand Junction, Colorado, a large academic primary care practice in the, within the University of Missouri Health System, and a health information network that supports primary care practices, particularly federally qualified health centers and other safety net clinics, and that was OCHIN in Portland, Oregon. And we spoke with those folks to collect examples of how primary care practices can deploy health IT for quality improvement um, in the real world. And we chose them um, because they represent different organizational structures and approaches to this work uh, based on recommendations from the expert panel and, and senior leaders at ARC. Next slide, please. 
So after speaking with all these smart people, we identified several factors supporting the use of health IT for quality improvement in primary care. This figure shows the four factors as gears. And the first gear that you see here is a practice culture with a strong commitment to using health IT for quality improvement. The second is high functioning health IT tools to enable tracking and extraction of data. The third is practice clinical team and staff knowledge and skills related to both health IT and quality improvement. And the fourth is practice processes and workflows that incorporate effective use of health IT for quality improvement. And ideally, these factors are supported by financial incentives and transformation assistance, which you see surrounding the gears. I'm going to discuss each of these in a bit more detail. Um, next slide, please. So first, focusing on practice culture, what does that mean? Well, having a practice culture with a strong commitment to using health IT for quality improvement comes from leadership. So often a healthcare champion, such as the lead physician or medical director, a nurse or a practice manager, someone who really embraces and holds others in the practice accountable to the principles and processes of a learning organization. What I mean by that is an organization that undertakes ongoing, continuous quality improvement work beyond any particular project and dedicates the necessary time and resources to use Health IT for ongoing quality improvement. And if you're interested in learning more about um, those concepts, I highly recommend um, the paper that I've cited at the bottom here by Aaron Taylor and colleagues. Next slide, please. The second factor that we found supports the use of health IT for quality improvement in primary care is health IT tools. Um, it, it, these are really the heart of the matter. They support quality improvement. They enable the practice to measure, track, and share healthcare delivery performance measures and monitor how refinements to clinical workflow processes affect overall patient experience and care coordination across care settings. So examples of health IT tools include electronic health records. I think that's the first thing most people think of in this category. These, of course, allow for structured data entry, which can be used both for basic data collection and also for data extraction, analysis, reporting, and tracking. EHRs really play a dual role in helping practices provide quality care to their patients and in facilitating population level assessments. The second tool we're highlighting here is registries, such as for specific diseases, immunizations, preventive health and procedures. These really facilitate identification of gaps in care to maximize usefulness of visits with patients and care management efforts. And to be most effective, um, registries should be interconnected and incorporated into routine practice workflows. The third tool I'll highlight is decision support systems that can prompt decision making by providers that's consistent with higher quality care. So for example, um, daily registry reports for patients with appointments that day can generate reminders um, for patients who need screenings for depression, they're due for a colonoscopy, or they have a high BMI uh, or other concerns. The results of registry reports can appear in the chief complaint section of the patient's electronic chart to cue the provider to follow up. And then the last tool here that I'll highlight is health information exchange. This is to capture hospital and ED use, laboratory and test results, medications, immunizations, and other information about patient care that can then be shared across multiple care settings in support of increased care coordination among a patient's various providers. Next slide, please. The third factor we found that supports the use of health IT in primary care, um, in quality improvement in primary care, is clinician and staff knowledge and skills. Um, these are needed to extract and analyze that health IT data that you've so lovingly placed into the EHR, um, to execute quality improvement methods such as plan, do, study, act cycles, and to redesign practice workflows to incorporate changes that are resulting from your quality improvement activities. Next slide, please. 
The fourth factor is practice processes and workflows. These consist of structured procedures to measure and report on practice level and clinician level data and provide feedback to clinicians as well as adaptations to daily practice activities, again, based on your quality improvement findings to improve patient care. Next slide, please. Now, ideally, all of these factors are supported by financial incentives. These are, these are crucial. These offset the costs of clinician and staff time spent on all of these quality improvement activities. They can include discounts on health IT, outside support for health um, information exchange infrastructure, additional payments from payers or shared savings models, in which part of any savings from, say, fewer ED visits or hospitalizations is shared back with the participating primary care practices. And transformation supports include activities such as data feedback and benchmarking to provide practices with actionable information on their performance um, compared with external benchmarks such as regional or national averages, along with suggestions on how to choose target areas for improvement. Another type of transformation support is practice facilitation or coaching. Uh, this usually happens uh, through external organizations coming into a practice to help folks develop skills related to health IT and quality improvement, to help practices organize their approach to quality improvement, provide tools and expertise, and also help troubleshoot challenges or barriers that come up um, in the course of trying to do this work. Expert consultation is another example of transformation supports. This is also called peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. This is where practices are paired up with, um, with uh, peers who can provide specific evidence-based knowledge. Um, you know, these tend to be other clinicians or staff outside the practice who can offer expertise. And then finally, shared learning opportunities or learning collaboratives to provide a community for practices to share challenges, lessons learned, and best practices, and also to draw motivation and inspiration from each other. So that covers the key factors that we found support the use of health IT for quality improvement in primary care. I'd like to turn now to some of the findings and recommendations we drew from our work on the case studies of exemplary primary care organizations. And again, if you're interested in reading the case studies themselves, which provide some pretty detailed examples of how this can all play out in real practices, please do check out the white paper. Um, next slide, please. So we sorted our findings by different types of stakeholders that are uh, interested in these issues. So we have findings that would be most relevant to practices, to IT developers, and to decision makers, so people working in policy or government. I'm not going to go over all of our findings, but here are some key ones, and I'm going to start with those that are most relevant to practices. The first point um, that we heard was that it's important to understand the time commitments, training requirements, and workflow shifts that are um, associated with this type of work. So establishing systems and enabling health IT for quality improvement doesn't happen in a day. Sometimes it doesn't even happen in a year. Um, this point is well illustrated by the experience of Foresight Family Physicians, which was the small independent practice um, in western Colorado that we used for one of our case studies. So at that practice, it was only when um, the practice joined the Beacon Consortium three years after first implementing its EHR that they began to consider transforming the way that they were delivering care using health IT as a tool in that transformation. And as you can imagine, this involved a significant amount of staff retraining over a couple of years, and the training focused on ensuring that data were entered accurately into structured fields in the EHR to create accurate reports on quality and identify gaps in care. And all of this had to be done before they could even begin considering changing work processes to improve care and address those gaps that they identified. Okay, the next point here is make the process meaningful. Um, it, transformation can, can really be facilitated by emphasizing that using health IT for quality improvement ultimately is going to help patients. This is particularly relevant because many primary care practices have extremely limited resources and understandably might view the use of health IT for quality improvement as something extra um, rather than something that is fundamentally helpful to the practice and to patients. 
The third point here has to do with establishing a dedicated quality improvement team as well as regular communication between that quality improvement team and the rest of the practice. This keeps quality improvement activities progressing and it builds those activities into regular operations. The next point um, has to do with um, planning. So before you begin quality improvement process, you need to clearly define the goals and consider the effects of new processes on the entire practice. So you have to be sure to consider your upstream and downstream effects. As someone from one of our case studies stressed, that new policy might take some nurses five minutes, but it might add 20 minutes to someone else's day. Moreover, the results of your quality improvement efforts might include significant changes, such as the addition of staff to address behavioral health needs um, or reallocation of staff roles and responsibilities to meet patients' needs. So some strategy is to clearly define your goals and consider the potential effects of QI at the beginning of your process. Include mapping out new workflows and testing new processes or policies on a small scale to assess the effects of a change before applying it to the entire practice. The last point here has to do with vision and leadership. It's not surprising um, that practice leadership, um, in some cases a clinician, in other cases another member of the staff, is critical in conveying to the practice as a whole how healthcare delivery and payment systems are likely to evolve, how health IT and quality improvement play a role in this evolution, and how to take the first steps to transform a primary care practice from one that uses little or no health IT to one that maximizes the use of health IT for quality improvement. Next slide, please. This is a quote from Dr. Gregory Reichs who's a leader of one of our case study practices. He says, you have to have a leader who has a vision of what the future might look like for healthcare delivery and how we will be graded and paid. I saw pursuing quality improvement through the Beacon Consortium and Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative participation as a way for us to begin that journey to a different healthcare delivery and payment future. Next slide, please. So moving on now to a few findings that are, that are relevant to health IT developers. First, we heard over and over again that it's so important to consider how health IT design and standards can support or hinder primary care practices that are attempting to use this technology for quality improvement. IT developers and primary care practices and organizations need to work together to ensure that health IT tools serve both the basic documentation needs of primary care and also the need to provide data and feedback to support quality improvement. The second point here has to do with interoperability of health IT um, and the information exchange standards and capabilities of health IT. It's really important to consider the various levels of interoperability of health IT that primary care practices require, both within the practice, um, within whatever larger health system the practice might be part of, and externally with other providers and health systems that are treating their patients. So without effective liquidity of patient health data, without secure information exchange across health IT systems, primary care practices are going to continue to face barriers to improvement of care for patients who are accessing care in multiple settings. Not all practices have the same medical record system. Um, therefore, processes and standards for electronic sharing of information across systems is crucial and something we need to work on. Um, and if you're interested in reading more about this topic, I highly recommend um, this article that I've cited here by Dr. Christ. Next slide, please. Here's a quote about health IT functionality from Dr. Rochelle Koopman from one of our case studies. It's frustrating when you purchase an EHR system and you think you're getting a certain set of functions and then you learn you need to put more money in to get the good stuff. This just underscores the fact that health IT tools themselves are not perfect. Um, they often require workarounds, <clears throat> but we need to keep working together um, with health IT developers to make them more functional and useful for quality improvement endeavors. Next slide, please. Finally, we have some findings that are geared towards decision makers, people working in the government or policy worlds. 
Um, the first is that practices benefit from having the latitude to choose their own quality improvement goals and to tailor their approach to using health IT for quality improvement accordingly. So decision makers and policy making bodies play a very important role in defining quality measures and establishing benchmarks and reporting processes. And those activities enable comparisons across practices. They provide a common set of goals and expectations to which practices can, inspi can aspire, and that's important. However, we heard that practices benefit from deciding for themselves which specific QI goals, quality improvement goals, are most important to their particular practice patients and community. So allowing for at least some degree of self-determination is an important motivator for practices because it really connects the quality improvement activities to the ultimate goal of better serving patients. The second point here, um, external technical assistance can be invaluable, uh, particularly for small independent practices that are interested in using health IT for quality improvement. Very few primary care practices are fortunate enough to have access to their own health IT and quality improvement training and expertise. And this just underscores the value of external help and coaching for these practices. The third point has to do with expanding the availability of funding um, to support the use of health IT for quality improvement in primary care practices. This creates breathing room in clinicians' schedules to perform this work. Even when providers highly value the use of health IT for quality improvement to improve patient care, they might avoid um, doing this work because they believe they should be seeing patients to generate income for the practice in themselves, which makes perfect sense. Uh, but practices that are able to offer some sort of financial incentives um, for providers to work on quality improvement can offset this reluctance. Next slide, please. Here's a quote from Dr. Scott Fields from OCHIN about the costs of health IT. Costs of health IT are wiping out practices that are on their own. They can't afford the infrastructure to do quality reporting work without being part of a larger organization in some way. And this just underscores the, the need for financial assistance for these types of activities. Um, next slide, please. Our recommendations echo many of the lessons that I just reviewed. Um, exemplary primary care practices have demonstrated that using health IT for quality improvement is possible in diverse settings and that it can pay off in improved patient care and health outcomes. Collaboration among primary care practices, practice facilitators, IT developers, and decision makers has the potential to spread best practices help with sharing valuable guidance and tools and ultimately increase the use of health IT for quality improvement in primary care. And as I mentioned, additional support, including targeted technical assistance and payment reforms, will help more practices commit to using health IT for quality improvement and ultimately ensure that patients are receiving the best possible primary care. Next slide, please. Before I turn it over to Dr. Doerr, I wanted to acknowledge our technical expert panel who provided excellent guidance and feedback in the development of this white paper. And you'll notice that Dr. Doerr, our next speaker, is actually included in this list for our technical expert panel members. Next slide, please. Um, these were our key informants from the exemplary primary care organizations who shared their stories and real world experiences with us. And we thank them. Um, next slide, please. And finally, we'd like to thank our colleagues from ARC who funded this research and collaborated with us every step of the way. Um, next slide. For more information, here's my contact info and the website where you can find the white paper. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. David Doerr, who will be talking about his experiences with applying health IT for quality improvement to the ABCS of Heart Health in primary care and lessons learned from the first year of the Evidence Now study as experienced in the Northwest Cooperative. Dr. Dorr? Thanks, I appreciate it. I think that um, that was a very good, uh, both previous speakers, Bob and um, Tricia, have done a great job in, in really laying the groundwork a little bit about what Evidence Now is about and then um, thinking about how we use health information technology in primary care. 
Um, I, these are really ground lessons. So I think that one thing we're going to see here is that the previous uh, work tried to find some exemplars who had been through a pretty significant struggle uh, already and had found some um, silver linings and approaches for this. And I think what we'll hear here uh, is that uh, we have a group of over 200 clinics who are interested in using HIT and other quality improvement strategies to improve the care of their patients, especially around heart health. Um, and they have a very wide set of experiences that relate to the components that we're talking about. Uh, but I think we've learned a few things about uh, that, that, those lessons as people are going through it. Next slide. A little bit about us. Bob did a great job of describing evidence now and the different collaboratives involved. So we're the three state collaborative, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. It's led by um, Group Health, the McCall Center specifically. Um, and Michael Parchman is our, is our principal investigator, and he's done a variety of work uh, around this space, both from a policy or from HRQ previously and, and in leading uh, collaboratives focused on quality improvement with HIT. We also have, um, in Washington and Idaho, we're a little bit split in terms of how people um, – can everyone hear me okay? You guys can hear me fine? Yeah. Uh, how everyone uh, – the people at Qualys are really focused on the Washington and Idaho uh, health information technology practice facilitation that we do, and Laura Mae Baldwin at – University of Washington really helps with some of the outreach and practice relationships. In Oregon, we have the uh, ORPRIN, led by LJ Fagnan, and they focus a lot on the practice relationships and outreach and quality improvement, really understanding where the practices are and what they're doing. And I am on the grants, I'm an internist and informatician, really to help understand this particular issue. How can we leverage the health information technology that the practices have as part of evidence now for us? They really need to have an electronic health record system in the works and progress in place mostly um, so that they could really move these measures forward um, and not start from scratch. And Despite that, we are finding a lot about um, the variability of their implementations and abilities. Next slide. Our approach is uh, not the same across all collaboratives for evidence now for how we try to help these primary care practices better use their health, health information technology in quality improvement. As you can see here, we are focused on teaching the primary care practices to fish. Some uh, of the collaboratives are using a much more health information exchange or data gathering and processing approach. This is um, not what we're doing. We are going to each individual practice trying to identify the way that they can use HIT more effectively first to produce the sets of measures that um, are part of Heart Healthy uh, uh, review or population management, so aspirin, blood pressure control, cholesterol, and smoking cessation. And then we're really trying to understand how we can help them learn to move that forward. And so it's really driven by the practice. That's, that's a big focus of us. We're really trying to get them <laughs> to learn what they can, to get the expertise they can, so it's sustainable beyond that. And one of the things that we immediately found out was that we, um, they needed a variety of approaches to be recommended. So some of um, the expectations are, if you're not familiar with some of the previous work in, for instance, meaningful use or certification of EHR systems, producing clinical quality measures electronically is part of that certification process and is expected. However, many of the practices, especially for this work, um, struggle to produce from their EHR natively the measures on a quarterly basis with the kind of 
standardization that we might expect. And so we've um, really looked at offering these, these sets of different options for them, including um, chart review, just so they can have some data to drive their quality improvement, all the while thinking we need to move them along this continuum so they become more and more facile with using their HIT tools more effectively. Next slide. So I want to go back. Um, Tricia actually set this up really well. <laughs> Um, in thinking about some of the tools that are available. So what we think about um, in terms of motivating quality improvement through HIT and using it to help practices, we think about providing them or finding them uh, tools, helping them find themselves uh, some tools that they can use. So we developed um, what we call the Pulse, which when they submit data to us that's extracted from their HIT, one of the things that's really useful is for them to be able to understand what that data looks like as compared to peers, as compared to others, as compared to themselves over time, and to be able to look at that, to have it in a single place that they can quickly get access to it. So we have a web application that's actually developed in Shiny um, that the practices or the practice facilitators can look at to understand what um, their performance is looking like over time. And you can see we just have two quarters here. Um, this is a blood pressure measure. It looks mostly the same over the two quarters. But it's instantly accessible. And um, there's some other standard um, metrics and some color coding so they understand where they might work to improve next. And this kind of audit and feedback, it turns out, um, is really helpful, actually, to have a collaborative so you can collect this information. It's really difficult to do otherwise because there's not great sources for it. So we do, we do provide this as they submit their data to us. Other components we um, really focus in on with them are then drilling down if they pick an area to patient list to kind of registry functionality by looking at their different patients, which is shown at the bottom right of the screen as a generic view, who's meeting the measures, who's not meeting the measures, how are they doing, so they can identify and then take action with this. And this is an interesting um, difference because if they have a report that produces the measure, they can often submit the measure, but actually getting that drill down capability um, is not always easy to do. And so those are two different steps that we talk to them about. And some who can't produce the report but can produce a patient list, we need to work with to allow that flexibility so then they can roll that up into the measure. So these tools, while separate, are really um, working together to have that kind of quality improvement. Next slide. And then the other part um, is really the workflow changes that she talked about. And these take lots of different forms. So there's a planning um, part where you're really like, how are we going to more reliably, across our population of at-risk patients, provide these set of um, recommended services and, and counseling? to them, and then how do we put that in so it's more reliable? As you know from previous research, people um, really um, are very intrinsically motivated to do this already in primary care. They really have a strong belief that, you know, for people who've had a previous stroke or heart attack and would benefit from aspirin, they want to provide that aspirin, they want to control their blood pressure, um, they want to address their cholesterol. But doing that reliably in the chaos of busy clinics or for a broad population who you may not see every day can be difficult. Um, so we also um, have ways that we talk to them about providing patient-level decision support so that in their standard workflow they can adjust their EHR to or whatever tools they have to more reliably bring up the discussion and make sure the counseling gets done if they're a smoker. Um, and this is just one clinical summarization where you might see different recommendations of, in this case, the blood pressure is high, that's something that they can address in the context of a broader visit where there might be many issues going on. There's other ways to do this as well, but this kind of integration and workflow can, can be very helpful. Next, next slide. So our approach is really very quality improvement focused, actually. Um, we, if, if we've learned nothing else, it's that we don't want HIT to limit progress in quality improvement capabilities. You, you heard from Tricia that getting a quality improvement team together that's meeting regularly is a really important sort of foundational element. We really believe in that. And these sort of um, 
high leverage changes that were identified by the group, um, our, our whole collaborative, are really part of that. And actually, um, HIT can facilitate many of these. It's core for some of them. Um, but is uh, we really try and prevent people from getting stuck with HIT. When people don't know what to do, they get stuck. And so um, our goal is really a lot of preventing people from getting stuck while they're going through their QI changes and, and, and building. Um, there, is a, there is a core thing is that they need to have some of this data. So we really talk to them as we work with them from the HIT perspective to understand what they think they can do. And then we bring knowledge to them about, oh, you know, your EHR could do this or this or this. Have you tried that? And a good example of that is the hidden tab phenomenon. Often our HIT practice facilitators will go into a clinic who said, I can't produce any of these measures. And they'll say, have you clicked on this registry tab before? Oh, no, I've never seen that. I've never used it. They click on it. Oh, I can get two of the measures right away. And so that kind of training isn't really easily available, despite I think the EHR vendors really would like to have practices do that. But finding the time to do that is really difficult for some practices. And then we provide a set of tools to help them through decision making, not make the decision for them, but then ask them uh, what they can do. So extracting data from their EHRs or through other queries. We also give contacts for user groups for EHRs, but also amongst their peers who have the same systems or capabilities, and then we provide the pulse. Next slide. So what have we found so far? I would say um, it hasn't surprised me, but I think that many people have been surprised about the vast um, differences in capabilities of exactly the same systems uh, implemented at roughly the same times and what people have chosen or not chosen to implement, or in some cases, um, the differences in the measures themselves. I mentioned the hidden tab phenomenon. Uh, one thing we found in our early work is that we'd ask practices what they could do um, on a survey, and then we'd talk to them either in person or on the phone, and then we'd really change the, uh, uh, their ability, what, what their potential abilities were using their system. And this is really important because some, some systems, it's a really a struggle to get the measures out and to use them or change them um, based on version or based on, on current capabilities. But some, it's actually easier than the practices think, and so that kind of conversation can be very helpful. We have, because of some of the need to change rapidly, focused on finding a set of registries where practices who are truly stuck can look at um, using those registries as a way to produce these measures on a regular basis. They provide some more flexibility. If, as you may remember, electronic health record systems were initially started for billing and documentation systems, and so this kind of population management isn't always easy. Um, their current in-house workforce, as mentioned, is pretty variable. Um, they might have just a person who's mildly interested Everybody might just dislike health information technology and find it to be um, less than helpful to them currently. And so these sort of um, workflow, workforce capabilities and abilities can be pretty uh, different. And so we've been working with a lot of practices to build that up. I'm part of a big um, training program in informatics here at OHSU um, where we do a lot of online work. And so we're able to tap into some of those educational uh, opportunities to, to move that forward, but it's still a gap, I think, for many. And then one thing that we found is that um, organizational factors are hugely important, but not in the ways that we always thought. So we've done some look at uh, size, uh, looking at size ownership and location, so rural versus urban, for instance. Um, those really, as you would expect, affect their ability to use HIT, but we actually found that urban independent practices as opposed to urban health system practices and rural system practices for us um, in Oregon especially were really most able to produce the measures initially. So urban system practices 
they might in some ways be too big. They have primary care is a big important part of what they do, but they may have many demands, um, hospital vertically, vertically integrated systems, and their ability to move quickly um, may, may be more limited because of that, whereas urban independent practices are very focused on that and we're able to at least initially change. So preconceived uh, assumptions weren't that helpful for us actually um, to really understand what people could do on the ground. Um, next slide. So um, there is more information from you, for you, um, my email address and, and our website if you're interested, and then I will pass it back to Anna. Anna, sorry. No, thank you so much. Um, so we have lots of questions coming in. Thank you, and please keep sending them. We, will, um, we have a few minutes left, and we'll um, aim to answer as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, we'll follow up after the, the webinar um, via email. Um, so the first question I have is, um, is for Tricia to begin to answer. How does the concept of creating a practice culture that is dedicated to QI look different in a small independent practice versus a larger, more integrated system? Sure, I can start with an example from a, a small independent practice, again, Foresight Family Physicians in Grand Junction, Colorado, which was one of our case study practices. Uh, at the time that we spoke with that practice, which was about a year ago, they had two physicians, a nurse practitioner, a, uh, a PA, a few care managers, a behavioral health provider, and some support staff, and they were taking care of about 5,000 active patients, so a small practice. Um, and I think this practice is development of a culture dedicated to quality improvement is particularly inspiring because they really started at ground zero. Um, so they learned that their community, the Grand Junction community, was planning to form a health information exchange in 2004. At that point, they were completely paper-based, and they just started the process of thinking about how to transition from paper to electronic records, but they didn't actually buy and EHR until three years later, until 2007. Um, and then for several years after that, they used the EHR for very basic functions only um, until one of the practice leaders, Dr. Gregory Reichs, realized that they could be using the system in a way that helped them strengthen quality of care and improve patient outcomes. At the same time, he realized his staff needed a lot of new training around how to achieve that, um, and they needed financial help um, to offset the costs of learning about quality improvement and using health IT for that work. So Dr. Reichs led the practice's application process to the Beacon Consortium and the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, and working through those two initiatives really gave the practice the tools and financial help they needed to slowly make the transformation you know, over several years. And now their practice culture is really built around quality improvement. They have a standing quality improvement committee. They pursue continuous quality improvement as a part of their day-to-day -day activities. And as I mentioned before, it's important to understand that this really took time. It required external technical assistance and financial help, and it really depended on some visionary leadership to get things off the ground and to keep everyone motivated over the, the several years that that all became a reality. Um, so then turning to a larger, um, more integrated system and, and what, um, you know, organizational culture that's dedicated to quality improvement might look like in that type of a system, we can look at the University of Missouri Health System as an example of a place where quality improvement is really embedded throughout the system. It's just become a way of doing things. Um, and how they've done this, one thing they've done at the University of Missouri is they've created a Center for Healthcare Quality, which runs educational programs on quality improvement. Clinicians can take classes through that center. They have the option to develop and implement quality improvement projects, and they have support and guidance from the center. Um, and in addition, the Department of Family and Community Medicine within the University of Missouri Health System has its own Director of Quality Assessment and Improvement. And that person has been working closely with the 11 different primary care clinics in the system for the past eight or nine years um, to educate, to support clinicians and staff on quality improvement methods and strategies. That person also supports practice level quality improvement efforts because every primary care clinic in the system is expected to work on at least two quality improvement projects per year. 
Um, and in addition to this, individual clinicians and primary care clinics um, overall as a whole receive quarterly email reports on data, on patient satisfaction, days until appointment, quality and utilization measures. Um, and they can look at those data anytime through the system's EHR dashboard. They're always reviewed at the clinic level during clinical faculty meetings. So in this case, there's been a real investment in internal support for quality improvement throughout the health system. And again, over time, continuous quality improvement has just become a part of the culture and a way of life at the University of Missouri. Great. Um, thanks so much, Tricia. Um, David or Bob, would you like to add to um, that answer? Uh, no, I think that was uh, that was particularly good. I, you know, so they're thinking directly about HIT and and sort of um, quality improvement building. Uh, you know, in a way, I think this sort of attitude towards quality improvement and wanting to get this team together is, is a very helpful sort of irrespective or perhaps for some people, despite what your HIT can do initially. However, sort of to get this real benefit, you'd start to learn how to get what you can out of your HIT and then continuously improve that to inform, to get the sort of data and information into your decision making around your quality improvement as you generate your change hypotheses. That is really the crucial part. And so people will use in traditional quality improvement you know, tallies and simple things that aren't the accountability measures that they um, are required to report, but are ways to understand how a process is actually working right now, and then they can adjust more readily. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, David, one question for you. Uh, how do you motivate clinicians and staff to use Help IT for continuous QI? They are already so busy, and this is commonly view viewed as just another burden. Yeah, there's probably two parts to this question. One is, um, you know, I think people feel very burdened by sort of data collection and um, putting that into the system and just expecting more and more things to be added. Um, so that's a big burden, just using the system. And, and um, definitely acknowledge that system. One of the things that I think is a great part of redesigning workflows, how to uh, leverage other team members, patients and families included, to better get that information and use it. Um, and then there's sort of, a, if you're using patient level support, I showed a clinical summary. Um, and the idea there is to reduce the time that it takes as people are reviewing a chart. Let's say you're caring for a patient. We have a team huddle. That's a common thing. We look at all the patients across the day and we say, what do they need? And a lot of what that does um, is we recognize we are searching electronically through the chart to understand, well, do they have this? Do they have that? And so if you can gather that information into a more um, useful format and have some kind of triggers in a single place or in a more efficient way, that sort of reduces the cognitive load of using the system um, overall. And then there's a third part to it, which is, you need to get data out of the system to really start to see that benefit, and that can be a big blocking point for people. They just don't know how to get the data out of the system. It's also really delayed. You've got to put a lot of data in before it's sort of useful to do that. And people feel stuck at a certain point. They're frustrated. I'm not getting what I thought I would get out of it. And that's a big part that we focus on is trying to get them to get some information out where they say, oh, now I see how I'm doing and I can take a look and do something different so I start to see that benefit. So it's a lot of sort of iterative, sort of patient, almost like a counseling uh, approach to, to helping people through, through that process. Great, thank you. Well, we're just about out of time, but I just wanna reiterate that if we um, weren't able to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the webinar. Uh, Bob, I'll turn it back over to you now for a few final words. Great. Thanks, Anna. I appreciate that. And, uh, and, and great questions. And I know there were a lot more coming, and uh, we've really only touched
touch the tip of the iceberg here. But I do want to highlight a couple things before we wrap up today. And, and first of all, um, the, there is much more work to be done. We really only have started uh, on this project. And if you're interested in uh, following the Evidence Now story at home, uh, here's what we anticipate coming in the future. Um, you can follow um, some of the stories that are out there uh, coming out of Evidence uh, Now uh, at www.ahrq.gov forward slash Evidence Now, and you can see some of these uh, topics listed here. So you can go to the next slide. And lastly, what I want to make sure I do today is to thank all of you uh, for, for, for joining us today, uh, taking time to, to, to be here. Um, a special thanks to our speakers, uh, Tricia Higgins and David Dorr. You know, great work on, on both of your behalf. This is really important to where we're going in the future. I want to make sure I thank the TAC and especially Anna, and Gabriella, and Tim for, for hosting the webinar for us, as well as we have a great team here at ARC who works on this project. It's just a joy to work with them. And then all of the Evidence Now grantees who are out there in the field uh, working with practices um, uh, to try to help them in the ways that Tricia and, and David have both highlighted. And then lastly, thanks again to, to all of you who took time to join us today, and I hope that now you're as excited about we are um, about this work, and I look forward to the next chance for us to get together uh, to talk about it. Uh, more things coming soon in the future. So thank you all, and uh, have a great rest of your day.